So let's, let's, let's get started tonight because we have a, a lot to go through and I want to kind of give the right context um, uh, as, as to how we're kind of starting and kind of where we're going. Um, the reality is, is that the entire True North seminar that we put together for this entire spring, that there was intentionality from the very, very beginning. Uh, we knew from the beginning that there were some difficult topics that we wanted to, uh, that we wanted to approach. Uh, and we'll talk about those in just a minute here, but the, the concept of just jumping straight into it just did not seem like the right approach. And so the point was, was that, look, let's really kind of spend the time laying the foundation. And so if you'll remember when we started all the way back in January, the very first class that we went through, which was a four, three or four week class went through, was about the dependability of scriptures. And what we did in that class was we set up the whole concept that the scriptures can be trusted. We can trust the way that they were collected. We can trust the way that uh, the authorship is determined. We can understand how archaeology plays in and supports. We can understand uh, how the transmission of the text. And, and, and the point being is that when if, if, you were, if you've been here since the beginning, kudos to you. Because I'm really, really going to ask you to, to build on this. And if you haven't been here from the beginning and you're just jumping in now because you heard the topics on Sunday and you were like, I'm all for the content controversy or maybe you're like I just I would really like to hear you know what the church's opinion on this I'm going to highly 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 encourage you go back um, and uh, by all means you know stay here tonight and come out the next three nights the next three weeks as we go through this uh, but go back it's all online it's on YouTube it's on our website go back and start at the beginning because we're going to make some points and we're going to make some conclusions and we're going to have some opinions about these topics. And if you have not yet settled in your own heart where you are in relationship to the authority of the scriptures, it could be difficult for you. And so we went through that first class where we said the scriptures can be depended. The books that we have, how they were collected, the reason the ones that we have versus the ones that maybe Catholics would say is in theirs. We went through all of that. And we built the case that we can trust what we're holding as in truly uh, God's word. And because we understand it to be God's word, we give it authority. We understand the role of the scriptures. And then we went through our second class, which was another four weeks, where we talked about the necessity of the scriptures really being the compass. That's where the true north whole title comes from, that the scriptures guide us through what are some of the more difficult questions and things. The scriptures are God's resume that we know who God is, not just by our own personal experience. Yes, we have personally encountered him. If you're a Christ follower, then hopefully you have personally encountered Jesus Christ. You have personally understood the, the witness of his spirit inside of yours. But the scriptures are his resume. The scriptures are what defines who he is, and that is where we, we go. That's our authority. That's where we turn to. We can't come up with our own opinions. We can't come up with our own ideas that we have to look to the scriptures, and that was the second class. And then the third class, we said the guidance scriptures, we used the book of Colossians as a case study where Paul was using the scriptures to steer the people in Colossians through a heresy during their time, that he was showing them that what might seem small to some people, and, we, and you saw that. We saw at the very beginning of the Colossians where he, Paul's warning them against uh, observing some Jewish rituals. And initially you look at that and you go, eh, is that really that big a deal? But then by the time we got to the fourth chapter of Colossians, you realized, or at least I hope you realized, just how big of a deal that was. That to live as if Christ is still external to you completely robs you of understanding the empowerment that he wants to bring in your life. And Paul was battling that. And one of the key things in Colossians was that Paul said that when it comes to the church, that so many of the arguments that detour people from the faith uh, Paul's words were, they're reasonable arguments. Remember Colossians 1, when Paul was writing, he said, they're reasonable sounding arguments that if you just sit for 30 seconds, you'll go, I, I kind of agree with that. And there's tons of things that the church today is agreeing to where to the person that is not reading the scriptures, to the person that has not done the homework on the dependability of the authorship or the authority or those kinds of things, they would say, it sounds reasonable to me. And that's the danger in it. It's a reasonable sounding argument, but it's completely wrong, or at least it's wrong in the sense that it goes contrary to scriptures. And that brings us to this fourth class at the end of the seminar, which is the durability of scriptures. And by what we mean by durability is that the same scriptures that Paul was able to use for the Colossians still stand true today. They still, it doesn't matter what the modern day teaching or the modern day cultural ideology is, they still are authoritative. They still are dependable. We can still go to them 
to understand what they're, how they're supposed to guide us through. That's why we spend so much time pouring into them and digging th through them. What are the four things we're going to talk about? Because there's actually probably six or seven that honestly we could tackle that are ideologies in our culture right now that I feel like churches are kind of taking in, swallowing, digesting, that is detouring the believers from the faith. I, I picked these four. I say there's six, but to me, these are probably what I would call the four top ones right now that are really detouring people in the faith. The first is this. We'll talk about why it's called Love Wins. But the first is how many churches today are swallowing something called universalism. And if that term sounds too big for you, that's why I gave you the definition of it. The definition is essentially it's a belief that just erases hell from the scriptures. It is a belief that God doesn't actually send people to hell. There's not a literal hell. It's a metaphorical thing. And then ultimately God will win everybody over to heaven. That's the first one. We're going to talk about that one tonight. The second one, which we'll do next week, is the fact that we can kind of all coexist. And there's a teaching that a lot of churches and a lot of people adopt. This was huge inside my office place uh, in Bethesda which is the idea that all religions are kind of just equal expressions of kind of the same thing. You know, they're just different cultural expressions, but ultimately they're all trying to achieve the same thing. And so we don't really need to suggest that one is better than the other or one is more exclusive or more authoritative. That, you know, just let people pursue God in their way and God ultimately honors that and it's false. The third one, when it, this is where it starts, to, well, you know, I guess uh, we, we really kind of hit the ground running is when we start going into some of the more controversial things and the, the love is love discussion, you know, we're going to ask the question, does God have an opinion about homosexuality versus heterosexuality? Or is it just all love is love? And again, the key to this, and you heard Brian say this on Sunday, we're not here to give you Coastal's opinion on the matter. Now, Coastal has, when I say that, I'm not saying that the church has no opinion on the matter, but my point is that the purpose for this entire seminar from January to now is that we're coming at this to say, what do we see in the scriptures about this? The point being is that you may be here on any one of these nights, and at, on any given point, on any one of these nights, you may go, I disagree with that. That's totally cool. However, if you disagree with it, the challenge to you is to go back to the scriptures, and if you would want to talk with us, we invite it. You want to debate, we invite it. You want to email, you want to discuss, you want to challenge, we invite it. But we're not going to argue it on the basis of your opinion versus my opinion or your cultural stance versus my cultural stance. We have to come to the scriptures to say, how are you reading it? How am I reading it? You follow with me? That's the only place that the church should have any kind of a discussion because the church does not form its own opinion on the matters. The church looks to the scriptures to say, what is the true north in this scenario? Same is true for the fourth one, which is this notion today that gender is completely fluid. And again, it's one of those things where people say, is that really a big a deal? It actually is because gender was God's original idea. Gender was God's original blueprint. So did he have an opinion on the matter? Does he get to weigh in, or do we as a culture go, nope, God doesn't weigh in, we determine it ourselves. So we're going to go through these four things over the next four weeks, and the purpose of this is, is like I said, it's the same as with Paul in Colossians, is that we are told by Paul repetitively over and over and over again to make our calling and election sure, to make sure to, that we are watching carefully how we walk. You saw in Colossians how Paul talked about how he and Epaphras and Apollos, how they wrestled and wrestled and wrestled because so many Christians were being detoured away from the faith. And we made that point in Colossians that the Christian life is not just accepting Accept Jesus, get baptized, come to church, join a small group, love life, be a good person, have fun, go to dinner at Fager's, go to the beach, enjoy life, and Jesus may just come back one day and everything's good. No, we said that the life of the, the walk of faith is defined in the scriptures as an ongoing struggle. It is something where we constantly check to say, is this in alignment? Are you with me? Love wins, the reemergence of universalism. How did this start for me? Uh, 2006, I was at a leadership conference out in Chicago, thousands upon thousands of other pastors. It was an annual leadership conference that this church out in Chicago would put on. And I went every single year. Uh, this is, you know, like I said, years ago. And not only would I go for the purpose of the teaching that this, this conference just had some of the best 
best teachers would show up at this conference. Man, they got the A-listers every year to come to this conference. It was a three-day event, and I would not just go for the teaching. I'd go because I would get the chance to see old friends, a buddy of mine that's a pastor in San Francisco. He would come. Another friend of mine is a missionary to Turkey. He would come, and we'd meet up in there, and that'd be like three days of just hanging out, you know, doing life together at night, and then we'd come to the conference and hear these teachings, and I was introduced to a guy. When I say introduced, I mean he took the stage. A guy took the stage I had never encountered before. His name was Rob Bell amazing. <laughs> this guy didn't just floor me, he floored the audience. His insight and knowledge into first century Judaism was amazing. His ability to take the New Testament specifically and to break down the cultural and historical background and all of a sudden bring it back to where the words you went, now I understand why Jesus said that or now I get what Paul was talking He just had this incredible grasp and he was Charismatic, and I don't mean charismatic in the Pentecostal spiritual side. I just meant he was funny. He could talk. He could engage. He would command the stage. He'd move around. He'd talk. And after that conference, I, I was a fan. I was sold. I was the classic conference fanboy. I was out in the foyer. I was buying his books. Had the church credit card. You know, it's not my own money. I don't do that here. To, yeah, actually, I do that here as well. But having said that, I mean, I was on board, and then I was reading his books, and his books were amazing, his writing was amazing, and then he was putting these video series out, and I was digesting those, and then, if, and then when I would see a conference, one of the first things I would think, 2006, 2007, 2008, when I'd see a church conference come up, I would go, I wonder if Rob Bell's speaking, and if Rob Bell was on the docket, I was there. He was just that good, and he was so good that by 2011, Time Magazine actually listed him as one of the most influential speakers in the world. 2011, he was a pastor of a church in, uh, I think it was Michigan, I may have that state wrong. He was a pastor of a church, it was called Mars Hill Bible Church, and the church was exploding. He was just that good of a speaker and a preacher and commanding the scriptures, so Time Magazine picks him up. That same year, 2011, that Time Magazine picked him up, that same exact year, he wrote this book called Love Wins. That's where the title of this one comes from. I had it instantly. So excited when it came in. This is before Kindles and you know, electronic copies or those kinds of things. Book comes in, and I was just so excited to get this book. And I started to read it. Something didn't set. The premise of the book, the premise behind the book, I think I have, yeah, I do, but I'm going to, let me just back up here for a second. The premise of the book essentially said that we as Christians, we have missed the power of God's atonement. I'm on board for that. I'm like, teach me more. And he said, one of the issues that we miss is that God's love never stops pursuing the lost. And God's love is more powerful than we realize. And then he paired that and said, and that has to be taken with God's sovereignty. And God's sovereignty, he said, is that God accomplishes whatever God wants to do. If God wants to do something, God will do it. Nothing will. We've taught that here. Go back to our Explaining the Evil course. We talked about that, those passages that say that God does what he pleases. And he said, if those two things are true, then if God loves everyone, if God loves the world, and if God wants to save the world, then God in his sovereignty will accomplish that. And he made the case in the book that ultimately everybody will eventually say yes to God's love. They may not say it in the physical world. And he said the reason they don't say it in the physical world is because we have mistranslated hell. We, we have misunderstood hell. He said Christians get raised on these stories of pitchforks and, and horns and, and fire and, and it's in this cavern that's somewhere in the center of the earth and, and everybody's going to be thrown there. And he said there's all these images. He goes, but the truth of the matter is, he said, is that the scriptures define hell less about this place that you go to. He said, scriptures more define hell as a state of existence absent God where there is pain and there's suffering. And he said, and you see that on the earth today. He said, you see that wherever there is rape, wherever there is genocide, wherever there is poverty, wherever there is hunger or starvation or whatever the case is. He said, wherever there is war. He said, in countries where there is uh, disease or famine. Or he goes, if it's an inner city and a small infant is born into a crack addicted home where the, where the infant from birth is already starving out of the, out of the womb. He said, God is absent in those situations, and that is hell. 
And he said, and the problem is, is that hell robs people of their ability to comprehend that there is a God of love. And so that's why people are blinded. And he says, God understands that. That's why he died for them. And so the fact that they die, let's say the crack uh, addict, the meth addict, overdoses and dies and never actually gets a chance to say yes to Jesus, they die, and he says, and God just is going to just punish them? He said, no. He said, there still comes a chance in the afterlife that God's love ultimately gets that soul to eventually comprehend who he is, and they still get to say yes, and at the end of all of that, God's sovereignty prevails. God knows how to redeem the entirety of humanity because the scripture says that he died for all people. That was the premise of the book. And I'm going to be honest with you. I had two reactions to the book. The first reaction was, I like this. Being honest. Remember Paul said, reasonable sounding arguments? If I could sit for 30 seconds... And remember, I now had three or four years behind me of having sat under Rob Bell's teachings, so his knowledge of first century Judaism and his previous teachings, I had never encountered anything false from the guy. And so I'm sitting there reading it going, maybe he's on to something. Because if I sit for 30 seconds, I like this God better than the one I was raised up to believe in. I like the idea that God ultimately is going to chase everyone, whether here in the physical life or in the afterlife. I like the, I, this. I, I could be evangelistic about this. There are times that I'm a little bit leery of evangelism sometimes because there are some things about God that are difficult and people wrestle with and because I don't have all the answers, I don't know how to answer everything, and so I'm leery about telling them God loves them because I know they're going to come back and say, well, if God loves people, why does he let this happen or that happen? And I don't have all the answers. I go, but if this, I could get behind this. There's a problem, though. I, had two, I said I had two reactions to it. The second reaction was, I don't know that the scriptures jive with this. I don't know that he has this right. And that sets a tension up between these two questions. It sets a tension up, and this is where this teaching called universalism puts people in a very awkward spot because it puts you in between two questions. The first question is, is what do you want to believe about God is true? I want to believe that God doesn't want to punish anybody. If you're a Christian and you take delight in the theology of hell, something's wrong with you. We don't preach about it because we like it, we preach about it because we look into the scriptures, but we don't take, we take, and no, I would rather believe that God, Rob Bell's explanation was so much better. But we're presented with those kind of challenges all the time. What do we want to believe about God? And you're going to realize in the next three weeks that in each of the topics, that same question is going to come back to you. That there's always a wrestling between what you want to believe about God And you'll hear people say this. People will say things along the lines of, you know, I can't serve a God that, and then you fill in the blanks, whatever that is. But here's the problem. I don't know that we get the liberty to say that. Because if you say, I can't serve a God that, what you're declaring is that you are the person that will determine truth, and God has to yield to your definitions. As if God is like, you know, trying to mark, do marketing to us, going, well, what do they want? Let me be what they want me to be. That's not how it works. And the second question becomes, what can I believe about God? What do I mean by the second question? The second question is, is if I go into the scriptures and I discover that hell is in fact real, if I discover that there is such a thing as eternal punishment, can I still serve and believe in God? That's a question that every single person in this room has to answer privately and personally. A church can't declare it. A creed can't make you say it. You're being a part of a church through membership doesn't solve it for you. The question is, is if we go into the scriptures and we find something, not just the topic of hell, anything, can you still let God be God? Can you let the scriptures be authoritative even though you don't necessarily know how to reconcile everything about that topic. This is where mature believers start to wrestle with God. There are tons of people that come to the faith and they just like the butterflies and the rainbows and you know the good feelings and the music. 
But then there are those that dig into the scriptures and go, I want to know more about this guy. You know, what happens in marriages that 10, 15, 20, 25 years down the road end in divorce, you'll counsel through these kinds of marriages and you'll find people, they'll say, you know, they're not the person I thought they were or they're not the person I met 20 years ago. In other words, that they've come to some other new conclusion about this individual. Well, that's because the love at the beginning was just more of an infatuation element. Then they began to actually get to know the individual. There are tons of people that leave the faith because the God that they felt, the romantic God, the God that they were all, oh, he loves me, he has a plan for me, he's gonna fix my budget, he's gonna fix my job, he's gonna fix this, he's gonna fix that. I'm in this great community of believers. And then 10, 15 years down the road, people start digging scriptures going, wait a second. Same kind of a thing. So we have to answer these questions. We have to ask these questions. Let me just real quickly for the sake of the benefit of being, uh, having some continuity here. Uh, universalism is not new. Rob Bell did not introduce a heresy. Universalism has been around ever since, uh, actually prior to Christ, believe it or not. Universalism is new. Here's the best definition that I can put to it. It's the belief that all human beings will ultimately be reconciled to God. The view holds that God's love cannot be resisted forever and that his sovereignty dictates that his plans uh, cannot fail because people clearly die prior to surrendering to Christ. The belief holds that some will yield to his love while living, Others will yield to it after death upon experiencing the state of the soul where God is absent. In other words, that hell is this, you die, you're absent from God, and because of the anguish of that state, you then say yes to God as a result of your being absent from him, and then ultimately that kind of quote-unquote holding pen is emptied as eternity goes on because people generally say yes later. That's kind of the definition behind this. And like I said, it's not new. It is not new. It has been around for an incredible amount of time. We'll talk about some of the proponents behind it in just a moment. But I just wanted to kind of give a definition for it here. What's key is this, though. What you have to understand is that people that hold to universalism, churches that adopt it, pastors that accept it, people that believe it, there's actually not that big a difference between you and them, between us and those that hold, people that hold the universal, they still believe that Christ had to die on the cross. They still believe that his atonement was necessary to forgive sins. They still believe the scriptures are authoritative. They believe all of those things. They just interpret it in a way that's different than you and I. And that's where, like Paul said, reasonable sounding arguments. We have to ask the question. We have to ask the question. Is it true And if it's not, what is the danger behind it? So how do people arrive at this? How does this kind of a thing actually emerge? How does this heresy kind of come up? There's a couple of passages that people always kind of default to, and I want to just kind of quickly take you through them. There's a lot of scripture tonight. Uh, I I love the fact I see some of you, uh, when when we teach on midweeks, I see you taking your phones and taking pictures of the screens. That, That is awesome. Uh, that, that you're taking those notes. Know this, we will put every single one of these slides with the scriptures uh, uh, online as well on our Facebook uh, page and inside the midweek group. Um, so if you miss something, because we're going to go through a lot of scripture here, just know that you'll be able to reference it at a later point. Philippians 2, 9 through 11, Paul writes and says that God exalted him, him being Christ to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, and that at the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow in heaven and every tongue acknowledge. Notice, and and a universalist would say, do you want to debate the word every? Every knee will bow to him. Every tongue will confess to him. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. That's a pretty strong passage, right? All, Paul says. 2 Corinthians, I forgot that I had underlines there. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling not a bunch of individuals, but God was instead reconciling the world uh, to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. See, you can already, just by reading these passages, you could, I guarantee you there's some sitting here tonight going, huh, It's a reasonable sounding interpretation. There's nothing, again, I just want you to kind of see how down to earth Paul was in Colossians when he said, I get it, it's reasonable. 
Last one for this section, 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4, Paul says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, kings, those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good, and it pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. God wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. You can't be more clear than that. What is God's will? God's will is that everyone would be saved. And this is where people like Rob Bell and previous proponents of universalism would say, if God wants it, who's going to stop God from getting that? You follow the line of thought. These are how these kinds of things are broken up. What we're going to do in the way of a true north is we're going to do two components here throughout the rest of the, the, the evening tonight. The, we're going to do basically a scriptural evaluation. We're going to look to the scriptures, just like I said. It's not, I'm not going to stand up here and wax eloquent about my opinion. We're going to look to the scriptures, and we're going to say, do the scriptures support this? Because again, please hear me. I would love for this to be true. <laughs> it's such a more, in my human understanding, it's such a more attractive approach. But we have to do the true north, and so there's two elements to the scriptural evaluation. The first scriptural evaluation, and if you haven't gotten this from midweek yet, you have an F in my course. Um, if you have not yet picked up that we interpret the Bible in context, then I don't know what you have been doing here at midweek. Um, maybe you're, it's crosswords on your phone, I, I, whatever the case is. Um, uh, but we t interpret the scriptures in their context. So the first part of the scriptural investigation I want to do tonight is I want to go back to those passages I just showed you, and I just want to ask the question, do they say what we just said, what, what we said they said? You know, we saw some verses. That's what we saw. We saw verses one or two here, three or four there. Do they say what universalists say they do? Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says, every knee should bow, or every knee will or should bow, and every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. The problem is, is that if you're going to set the notion up that Paul is a proponent of universalism when he writes this, there are problems involved. And the first problem is this is that if you take Philippians in the context of the whole letter, there are other places, actually more places, talk about destruction than they do universalism. Paul says in Philippians 1, 27 to 28, the very last thing, that it's going to be a sign to the unbelievers that they will be destroyed, but that you'll be saved. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 to 20, Paul says, For as I have often told you before, and now I tell you again, even with tears, catch Paul's heart in this matter. He doesn't delight in talking about this stuff. With tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomachs. Their glory is their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. We understand our citizenship is in heaven. So if you're going to make the case in Philippians that Paul is proposing that everyone's getting saved, you now have to reconcile the problem that more times, and I'm only showing you two, more times than not, Paul talks about the destruction. And no, there is no clever interpretation of the Greek word there. It means utterly destroyed. Those that choose to say no to Christ, Paul says, Destruction is the end game for them. Not a holding pen, not correction. He doesn't say they'll be corrected. He doesn't say they'll be penalized. He doesn't say that they're, he says destruction. But more than just the context of in that passage, we also have to look at the biblical context. What I mean is by the biblical context, we interpret the uh, uh, books not just within themselves as conceal, uh, contained units. We look at the entirety of scripture. And what you'll realize is that that passage we just looked at, every knee should bow, every tongue confess, is actually, Paul is pulling that from Isaiah. It's a quote. Paul's not making it up on his own. Paul's not giving you his own opinion. It's a quote from Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 45, verses 23, God's speaking through Isaiah, and God is saying that at the end, that ultimately at the consummation of all things, he says, surely every knee is going to bow to me. Every tongue will confess. The point being, not that they want to do it, not that they will desire to do it, just that God's truth ultimately will cause there to be an acknowledgement that he is who, it doesn't mean that they, as a matter of fact, Revelation says that even in the midst of their acknowledging it, they will still reject God and say, just let the earth fall on us, we still want nothing to do with him. There's people to, you get this, every four years, when an election happens, one side of the country, one part of the country will say, we acknowledge that person is the president, but not listening to that fool. 
We all do that. We acknowledge it, but we don't ultimately yield ourselves to it. That's what this passage means. You see the interpretation of it in Isaiah 46, 1, where God says, Bel will kneel down, Nebo will bend low. Those are the Babylonian gods. They're not really gods, but God is speaking metaphorically, going, I will cause even their, their, their gods to bow before me. Isaiah 45, verse 9, people who argue with their creator are in grave danger. They are like the shards of a pot that has been smashed on the ground. That is their end. That's what Paul's pulling from. Paul's not making a case in Philippians that one day everybody's just going to go, yes, Jesus. They're just going to acknowledge that God was in fact who he says he was, but their hearts still will not. And destruction is the end. Again, we're just looking at the passages. 1 Corinthians 15, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. And the point making is that people will say, it says all, it says all. This oftentimes is debated in a grammatical context. People will say, does it not say all? And people will try to trap you and say, does it not say all? As if everywhere in the scriptures the word all happens, it means all. And that's clearly not the case. Look at Mark 1, 5. Talking about Jesus, it says people from the whole Judean countryside, not Jesus, uh, John the Baptist, it says people from the whole Judean countryside and all of Jerusalem were going out to John the Baptist to be baptized. We clearly know that not every single person in Jerusalem went to John the Baptist to get baptized. All is a figure of speech. Acts 1, 28, when certain leaders came against Paul and the other apostles and they were trying to stir up false beliefs, they said in Acts 1, 28, men of Israel... Listen to this. This man, they were talking about Paul. This man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people. Of course, Paul had not taught everyone everywhere. And so the point is, is that when a person gets on a single verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, and wants to make the case of universalism on the point of a single word grammatically, that, that's a scary thing to do. All does not mean that all are going to ultimately be saved. It means that God has opened it to everyone, but it's not going to be for all. And I just have at the top of that passage, if you'll notice, one chapter over, again, the same thing. If you're going to make the case that Paul is trying to push that all be made alive in 1 Corinthians 15, you have a problem in 1 Corinthians 16 where Paul will close out the entire book by saying, let anyone who has no love for the Lord be damned. The Greek interpretation of curse, damn, damnation, so it's kind of a funny thing to say that all are going to get made alive and then Paul closes the letter by saying, but those who don't love Christ, they can be accursed. You, you, you follow here. All we're doing is looking contextually to see that sometimes when people try to push these points on the scriptures, there is a problem within them. What about 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4, that God wants all people to be saved? And here's the thing, he does. It's not wrong. God does want all people to be saved. And somebody would say, well, if that's his will, doesn't he accomplish that? But and allow me just for one minute to get just a little bit theological, so put your boredom caps on. In theological circles, there is a difference between what is called God's moral will and God's decreed will. And this is just theologians. When theologians write theological concepts, all they're trying to do is put some organization to what they see in the text. And when you go through the text, if you pull all of the verses out that talk about what God wants and God's will, you'll understand that there's two categories. There's God's moral will and his decreed will. God's moral will is what God wants. It's what he desires. But man's free will can override. Great example, 1 Thessalonians 4.3. Paul says, for this is God's will. Hear, hear the language. This is God's will that you become holy, that you keep away from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own body in holiness and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who don't know God. That is God's moral will. He wants sexual purity. But the most recent survey of Christians, the most recent survey, I believe 2019 was the year, found that 68% of Christian men daily Daily engage in pornography. Daily. 68%. Is that fulfilling God's will? And if that statistic does not alarm you, 50% of pastors in American churches admit to regular use of pornography. Pastors, 50%. And unless you think it's all 
men that we're just kind of like Neanderthals in our appetites like the Gentiles. It is significantly growing among women as well under the age of 25, and this is 2019, over 33% of women under the age of 25 admitted to daily use of pornography. That's Christians being interviewed, by the way. So this is an example of God's more. God wants sexual purity, but we, through human choices, can override that. That is different from what we call God's decreed will. God's decreed will is what he wants, and he's going to do, and he's going to accomplish, and it is not contingent upon anything regarding human free will. An example, Revelation 4.11, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power since you created all things, and because of your will, they, are, they exist and they were created. God did not consult us on creating the heavens and the earth. God did not consult us on the plan of salvation. God did not consult us on the new heavens and new earth. That's his decreed will. So you have to distinguish between those two things. So when Paul writes in Timothy and says that God wants all people to be saved, that's God's moral will. He does want that, but it's not going to happen. The same way that Christian men are not living sexually pure lives, even though God wants that. So, again, just from a scriptural investigation along these kinds of things, we understand that those passages, when you first read them, they're reasonable. And if you hear an eloquent speaker like a Rob Bell, if you hear a pastor of a church, if you're watching online to some of these mega churches and pastors who are more and more adopting universalism, you hear them speak for 30 minutes and they got jokes and they're funny and they got cool jackets and cool hairdos and, they're, and, and the worship team's amazing and they talk about God's love of all people and you go, man, that sounds good. But you go back to the scriptures. That's true north. And those four hallmarks of universalism, when you dig into them, you go, it's not what they're saying. They are not saying God's going to rescue every single person. The other part of our scriptural evaluation is this. The other part of it is that after we've looked at those passages in their context, we still have to deal with this problem of hell. Does hell exist? Where did that come from? Do the scriptures talk about hell and and punishment and those kinds of things? This is a uh, quote from a universalist that was interviewed by a um, uh, prominent uh, Christian uh, apologeticist uh, by the name of um, Gordon MacDonald, and he interviewed him and wrote a book about it, and this was a quote of the the guy. One of the things that Gordon MacDonald, when, when they would debate in these debates and it would get written and translated into books, he would say, you know, there's nowhere in the scripture... Nowhere, there's not a single verse in the entirety of the scripture that talks about a person saying yes to God after death. Now, I know that some of you have some ones that are coming up and you're thinking about Lazarus and the departure and the chasm and the this and that, and the other, but I will challenge you that there's not a single, not one, that talks about a person achieving eternal salvation with God after death death, not one. And this universalist was proposed with that, and here was his answer. He said, clearly my interpretation is under determined by the text. I am not so much exegeting the text, that means interpreting the text, as trying to draw out the logic of New Testament theology as I understand it and its implications for those texts. In the process, I may be offering ways of reading these that go beyond what their authors had in mind. If that's not a red flag for you, I am interpreting the logic of the New Testament. I understand that I may be offering ways of reading these that go beyond with the original. Anytime a person suggests that they are taking the text outside of what the original author intended, you shut them down. Whether you like, you may not like what the text says. You may say, I don't even like what Paul wrote there, but I can't allow somebody else to say, well, then let's read it a different way. Because if you choose to read it a different way because you just don't like it, then you are in the category of living with a God you want to believe in, not living with a God you can believe in. And we talked about the dangers of that. If you are the person determining the truth, if you're the person creating the interpretation of the text, you're actually living as God. God's not, you are. You're saying, I'm the one who is the source of truth on this. And that's a dangerous place to be. So let's just go through some of these things. 
A little bit rapid fire here, but what you're going to discover, what you're going to discover is that Jesus does, in fact, whether you like it or whether you don't, that's for a different time. Jesus does, in fact, talk about an eternal end. He talks about a division between those that will accept and surrender to him and those that will not. And it's all throughout the scriptures. Matthew chapter 13, Jesus presents him with another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a person who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, an enemy came and sowed darnel. That's, a just, that's one translation of, of a Greek. A darnel is a, a plant that looks like wheat, but it's actually toxic to the human person. It says, an enemy came and sowed darnel among the wheat and then went away. And when the plant sprouted and produced grain, that darnel also appeared. So the workers of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, we thought you just sowed wheat here. Where did all this darnel come from? He said, an enemy's done this. So the workers replied, do you want us to go and gather it? And he said, no, because if you gather it at this point, you could uproot and mess up the weed as well. Let both grow until the harvest. And at the harvest, we're going to separate it. And this will go towards destruction, and this will get gathered. These kinds of parables and teachings are all throughout the scriptures. Luke 13, someone asked him, Lord, only a few going to get saved? Jesus said, I need you to exert every effort to enter through the narrow door. Just, just that phrase alone, narrow door, should raise some understanding in your part that heaven is not something that everybody universally gets in. Because many, I tell you, are going to try to enter, and they're not going to be able to. Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door, then you'll stand outside, and you'll start to knock on the door, and you'll say, let us in. But he's going to say, I don't know where you come from. And you're going to begin to say, but wait a second, we ate and drank in your presence, you taught in our streets, but he'll reply, I don't know where you come from, go away from me, you evildoers. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves are being thrown out. Again, you may not like these words. We know that many at Jesus' day didn't like it either. We know that when Jesus would heal and would feed, he would be thronged with crowds. But when Jesus would teach, people would split because they didn't like it. They liked the healing. They liked the free food. But when Jesus would start to talk about the requirements of heaven, people would bail on these elements. And this isn't just Jesus' teachings. This goes all the way back into the Old Testament. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Many of those who sleep in the dusty ground will awake, some to everlasting life, and others to shame and everlasting, not temporary, abhorrence, destruction, ruin. The scriptures repeatedly talk over and over and over about a God who ultimately judges between evil and righteousness, between those that are covered by Christ's atonement and those that are not, and speaks to the reality of an end time judgment and destruction. Again, you may not like that. That may not sit well with you. And as I just said at the beginning, that's not, it's not a pleasant topic for anybody. But you can't do away with the fact that it's in the scriptures. And so it puts you in that position of going, are the scriptures my true north? How do I reconcile this? How do I deal with this? People have wrestled with this for ages, folks. One of the earliest ones, Origins, one of the early church fathers is one of the first people, that, or I say one of the first people, one of the earliest, most well-known theologians that, that, that was so bothered by the presence of hell in the scriptures that he tried to do creative interpretations that ultimately got him excommunicated for a period of time from the church. And all he was just trying to do was say, I, just, I, 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 have, I don't know how to reconcile these things. C.S. Lewis was bothered by it as well. C.S. Lewis, Chronicles of Narnia, all the other books that he wrote. Uh, in one of his books, C.S. Lewis ultimately wrote, in his book, The Great Divorce, he basically described hell not so much as a place of punishment, but as a place where we're just kind of distant from God. And over time, if enough of eternity passes, we just kind of phase out into existence. We don't really go through pain. Or, and that during that period of time, God ultimately allows a person to kind of say, no, 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 Lord, I, I do want to come back. And we're talking about after death. C.S. Lewis, he could not reconcile for a period of time the teachings on hell. And then Rob Bell. And I already told you Rob Bell's approach. Rob Bell's approach was that hell was not so much a place, a, a, a future place of destruction or punishment as much as Rob, in Rob Bell's translation, Rob Bell's approach was hell is when there are circumstances on earth where God is absent and that 
is just, and, it, and it's just chaos. It's people's homes when Jesus, when, when, when it's not a Christian home and there's divorce and anger and fighting. It's a inner city where there's poverty and drug use. And, and, and for Rob Bell, that was, that was hell. That was his translation of it. That's how he approached it. So throughout time, people have wrestled with these things. Where did Rob Bell ultimately get that from? For Rob Bell, he wrestled with this notion that when Jesus would say hell or when our English uh, Bibles translate Jesus talking about hell, that it uses this Greek term, uh, uh, which is translated literally as gina, but it's actually known as Gehenna, and it's a transliteration of a Hebrew term, uh, uh, Gehenam, or the Valley of Gehenna. And here's how the teaching goes. The, the teaching goes, and Rob Bell proposes this, and Rob Bell doesn't just propose this. My favorite Bible of all times, the NET, holds this as well. The teaching goes this way. The teaching says that where I, why Jesus uses that word Gehenna is because there was this valley outside of the city, and it was this valley that was used to throw trash into, rubbish. It was the city garbage dump, but they didn't just use it for the city garbage dump. They would also take... Uh, people that have died of leprosy, people that had been that had died of diseases, um, and they would just put the bodies in that dump, and and they were always burning trash and burning bodies, and you can imagine, it was just a place of complete despondency, and it was in this valley called the Valley of Gehenna, Gehenna. And so the teaching is that Jesus would use the word, when he would talk about hell, he would use the word Gehenna to create this illustration about that valley, the same way that Jesus would talk about farmers or seeds or wheats or fish, because those are all illustrations people got. So when Jesus wanted to talk about what life was like without him, he would say, it, it's like that garbage dump. You know, you're, you're, you're essentially letting that be in your home. And people would go, oh, the valley of the trash and the burning. Yeah, I don't want that, Jesus. And Jesus would say, well, that's what it's like to be absent me. You know, that's ultimately where you will end up. But God wants to rescue you from that. And, and, and this is a great teaching. Like I said, even in this NET note, you'll see at the bottom of it, it talks about this valley. There's one problem with it. It's completely false not a shred of archaeological evidence that ever shows that that was there. Never. There's not a single writing, Josephus or any of the others, Philo, any of the other historians, there is not a single other mention of this valley. The earliest reference we have of this valley is from 1200 AD by a rabbi in Europe. That's the first mention. we. It didn't exist, but people have taught this. Rob Bell went, I like this. I'll choose this. You say, well, what was the purpose of the word then? The purpose of the word was actually, um, th there's multiple places. I'm going to try to pick up the pace here a little bit. But th this, is what, this is actually, you're looking at the Valley of Gehenna here. This is just outside the city of Jerusalem. This is actually the Valley of Gehenna that is referenced. It is a real valley. It is a real place. It's not a false place. But the only mention of it in the scriptures as it relates to fire is passages actually from the Old Testament where what we learn is that it was in this valley that there were practices that pagan cultures and then Jews began to pick up these cultures that there were practices that they believed in these false gods, these gods that you saw a couple of minutes ago. Remember we said that God referenced these Babylonian gods of Nebo and, and bow and they will bow to, that the practices were that to satisfy these gods, you would have to sacrifice your children in fire and they would burn their children. And this valley came to be known as this valley of torment because there were always these furnaces going on. And this, again, we're talking Old Testament times, predating Jesus. But it was these cultural notions that if you want these gods to, to bless your farmlands, to bless your life, if you want pestilence to stay away, if you don't want famine to hit the land, these gods have got to be appeased. And so they would have these child sacrifices. And ultimately there came this prophecy by Jeremiah where Jeremiah would talk about this future time. It was a metaphorical statement where Jeremiah would say that God never decreed this. I say Jeremiah, it was actually the Lord saying, I have rejected the people because of what they have been doing. They've set up their disgusting idols in the temple that, I've, that I have claimed for my own. They've defiled it. They've also built places of worship in a place called Topheth in the valley of Ben-Hinnom. That's the valley we're talking about. So they could sacrifice their sons and daughters by fire. And this is not something I ever commanded them to do, God says. And so God says, what I will ultimately do for their practices is I will then consign them to 
fire and God uses this metaphorical play on words going, they use the valley for that, but they will be consigned to an eternal valley. Of, and that's how that phrase Gehenna came to ultimately mean eternal punishment, not because of a garbage dump, but because in Jeremiah, God had used that language to say, you did this and opposed me. That will be your eternal lot as well. That's where the word comes from. You follow? I don't know where the time goes on Wednesday nights. Matthew chapter 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be assembled before him and he will separate people one from another like a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right, the goats on his left, and then he will say to those on his left, depart, you accursed. There's where Paul gets his language from in 1 Corinthians in 16 when he said, those that don't believe, let them be accursed. Into eternal fire. Notice the contrast between what the righteous get and those that say no to God and rebel against him. Eternal life versus eternal punishment. And again, these are Jesus' words. These are not a book that I ordered from some Christian author somewhere. This is not some pastor. This is not a theologian. This is not Origins words. This is not see it. Jesus was the one. And, and, and this phrase, and people have tried to dance around this. People have suggested that the Greek language that's ultimately being used here in this language, that the Greek terminology behind this, that, 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 that people have tried to make the case that the word for punishment here is ultimately translated uh, pruning or correction. And they've said, no, what Jesus really said was that the ones that have to depart from him, they're going into a place of what is correction or pruning. And I don't have the time tonight. I wish I did because it's a lot of fun to go into the Greek language and show how it kind of, but I wasted all that time on Gehenna. So this one, you're just going to take my word for it. But people have danced with this word and said, it's not punishment, it's correction. But there's significant problems. It, it, they're wrong, but rather than just saying they're wrong, I, I just kind of want to show you why there's significant problems. This. The first is that this phrase that's used here for eternal punishment, it's only used three times in the entire New Testament, and every single time it means punishment. It never means correction. The second problem is that when Jesus talks about this, Jesus does not just talk about this place being a place for humans that have ultimately said no to him. Jesus talks about the place ultimately being prepared for Satan and his demonic forces as well. And I have news for you. Jesus is not planning an eternal place of pruning and correction for Satan. <laughs> Notice that when Jesus talks about the eternal punishment, he does not say he prepared it for us. The scripture says that ultimately it was prepared for the adversary because of his rebellion. That the concept of hell and punishment says, Jesus says it was prepared for Satan. It was prepared for his hordes of his legions, of his angels and his demons. But those that choose to follow him are going with him into it. It's not a place of correction. It's not a place of pruning. And the truth of the matter is, is that all throughout the scriptures, when Jesus talks about these things, never, ever, ever is he talking about correction. He's talking about eternal destruction, eternal punishment. It's dark, I know. But again, are you serving a God that you want to believe in or are you looking at the scriptures to understand and ask yourself, can I believe? The scriptures absolutely hold, and this is all throughout the whole New Testament. We're coming to a close. All throughout the New Testament, Paul writes, over 80 times, Paul speaks about this destruction, this judgment that takes place. Matter of fact, in one place, when Paul is in Athens, Paul is invited to a collection of Greek philosophers and, and, and Stoic uh, uh, teachers, and Paul gets a chance to speak to these guys. They're Gentiles, they're Greeks, they're not Jews, they weren't raised in synagogues, they weren't raised in Jerusalem, uh, they know nothing about the Old Testament, they know nothing about Yahweh or about uh, Jesus of Nazareth. They're, they're Greek scholars, and, and, and they invite Paul, to because Paul's been preaching around the area, and they get a hold of him, and they say, you should come talk to us. So he gets an invitation to come speak to a Gentile audience that has none of the backgrounds. And in the limited time that Paul has, here's what Paul says. 
It says that Paul was waiting. This is Acts chapter 17, and I'm pulling various verses. You can go back and read the entire chapter to make sure that I'm not pulling this out of context. That's your duty. It says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was greatly upset because he saw how much the city was full of idols. So then Paul stood before the Arapax when he got the invitation, and here was his message to them. God has overlooked the times of ignorance. He has overlooked the times where people did not know who he was, but he now commands all people everywhere to repent because he has set a day on which he is going to judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he designated. He's talking about Jesus having provided the proof to everyone by raising him from the dead. I want you to notice what Paul did not say. Paul gets, what, 15, 20 minutes to talk to these guys? Paul does not go in and say, God loves you. He's got a plan for your life. He wants to fix. He wants to bless. He wants to pour money. He wants to pour finances. He, he, I've got personal prophecies for you. If you just come up here, I'm going to... But he, God wants to be your friend. He wants to be your... He doesn't speak about any of that. He gets this one shot and he says, you need to understand this God has set a day for judgment. What will you do with the time prior to that point is what Paul is pushing on. That's how serious he takes it. And if you don't think that that's enough, look at how he writes in 2 Thessalonians 1. This is evidence of God's righteous judgment to make you worthy of the kingdom of God for which, in fact, you are suffering. It is right for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to you who are being afflicted to give rest together with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels with flaming fire He will mete out punishment on those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will undergo the penalty of eternal, not temporary destruction, not pruning, away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his strength. Is that clear enough? Again, you don't, nobody likes it. But the question is, is what do you do with it? You can't just go, I don't believe it. That's not an option. Not when Paul talks about it 80 times in the course of the New Testament. Is this a problem? Here's our close. Is this a problem? More and more and more churches are adopting universalism today because it's an easier reading of the scriptures. Brings in more people, I'll tell you that. You can pack places out with thousands if your message is God loves you and he wants to redeem you and he has things for you. And if that's the only message you have, you can bring in some money and build some big buildings. The moment you start going, he sends the rest of you to hell, people are like, I'm out. Rob Bell had a split. Rob Bell, and kudos to his elder team, the Christian world, when he wrote that book, gave him about a year of leeway. People questioned him. He was invited to conferences to explain his point of view. Ultimately, his elder said, Rob, if this is your viewpoint, that... And Rob said, it is. I'm not changing it. And his elder said, you, you, you need to resign. And so he did. His church was massively growing. He resigned. His elders asked him to step out. Guess who picked him up? It's, it's on the screen. <laughs> That's Oprah, by the way. If, if you don't know that, then this, that was, the picture wasn't worth the weight of putting it in. Oprah picked him up. Oprah loved the teachings. Loved his book. She had her book club. Rob moved to L.A., and today, Rob speaks to hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of people about a God that loves and does not want to punish. Think it's dangerous? This is why so many people say, yeah, I'm a Christian. This is why so many people say, yeah, I believe in God, because they believe in the God of people like Rob Bell, not the God of scriptures. There is no true north in these kinds of things. But it's not just that Rob Bell is out ultimately... Uh, speaking these things. There are implications for you and I. Three questions and then we're going to close. Here are the three questions that I think are the biggest implications of this teaching. Question number one. Ask yourself this question as a part of this True North series. And not just asking this question about this one topic tonight. I want you to ask this question for the next four weeks. Are you serving the God of the scriptures or are you serving a God of your own making? Do you truly know what the scriptures say about the topic? The notion that God punishes eternally those that do not ultimately yield to him is hard to swallow. Can you serve that God? When we get a couple of weeks from now into some of the more, I I think, what people would assume are grittier topics, and people walk in here going, I don't understand why God would have an opinion about homosexuality. 
Will the scriptures win out or will your opinion? That's a question for you to solve, not for me to solve. Can you serve a God who ultimately decides that those who reject him will spend eternity in a place of torment? Because that's what the scriptures define. And it's not a theological lesson. It's a spiritual point for you to go. And look, if this makes God a little bit scary, then maybe you'll now understand a little bit why there's so much talk in the scriptures about the fear of the Lord. Not fear as in I'm scared of him, but fear in realizing that his justice and his holiness require certain things that we don't grasp in our minds. We don't understand fully why this is the case. And the question is, is I don't need to understand fully. I'm just going to trust that he is righteous and right in his decisions on these things. Question number two. Oh, I got to skip Romans. Yeah, I do. What are the implications for your own life? Peter says this, don't forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord's not slow in keeping his promise as some think of slowness. Instead, he's patient. He doesn't want anyone to perish. There again is that moral will. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He does want everyone to come to repentance, but the day of the Lord is going to come and when it comes, it will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear. The elements will be destroyed. The earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will ultimately be destroyed this way. 2 Peter 3.11. What kind of people ought we to be? That is a question that you and I should not dare try to answer tonight. That is a question that should be a life mantra for you. How are we supposed to live knowing that God is not just a God of love and blessing and grace and goodness and fun times and he's our homeboy, but he's also a God of judgment, a God who ultimately makes a decision about the end, a God who ultimately will judge whether people have surrendered to him. And when that day comes, Peter says, like a thief, and knowing it will come and it will catch people off, how should we be living? How should you be living? What does this mean for your daily interaction? What does this mean when you go, oh, Pastor, I've been trying to read the Bible and just I've never gotten around to it. Just going to let that one sit there. Here's the last one. How does this affect your understanding of Christians within our culture? Right now, our culture is looking at Christians as hate-filled bigots. Right now, our culture thinks that we are suck-on-sour lemon that we just hate homosexuals, we hate transgender, we hate liberals, that Christians just hate, hate, and all the definitions that are building right now, all the culture is building along this line of this notion that we're just hateful people. And here's the thing, if there is no hell, then that criticism is warranted. If there is no hell, then we are hate-filled people. If there is no such thing as hell, then we have got to be some of the most deranged people to be proclaiming that God wants to eternally punish those who do not follow him if hell doesn't exist. If hell is real though, then I don't know that we're hate-filled people as much as we are so passionately in love with God and with his culture that we just want to see people saved. You get that you see how that flips on its end? The only reason that we would even have an opinion about things like homosexuality or transgender or is that if if there is even remotely a chance that that would put a person in a position, then am I hate-filled for trying to say, hey, the bridge is out, you shouldn't drive down that road. And if anything, it is the epitome of love for Christians to be willing to take on that kind of ridicule from the culture and go, but I'm still going to keep proclaiming it. Paul did that. Paul actually at one point in his letter said that he, if he could, he can't because God doesn't let anybody stand in substitution. But Paul actually writes in one of his letters, he says, if I could, I would take eternal punishment if it would mean God would accept somebody else. The truth that hell exists, the truth that people could lose out on eternity with God and that there is such a thing as judgment and punishment, 
means that we do not talk about these topics because we delight in them, because we find them disgusting, because we're just some type of puritanical purist who just, you know, we talk about them because we go, it is the epitome of love to warn people if, if it's true. If it's not, we're messed up. If it is, we're people who love. You follow. That's 60 minutes of passage of passage of passage. How do you end? There is no way to end this. But here is my challenge to you. I'll, like I said, we'll post these. Maybe a lot of you took pictures here. This is a topic for you to wrestle with. This is a topic for you to go before God and say, help me on this. But it is not something you can just dismiss or ignore. That's not an option. It is not an option for you to say, because if that's the option, then you're not serving the God of the scriptures. You're serving the God that you won't want, personally want to believe in. And that's a dangerous thing as well. Wrestle with this. Because if it's true, which I'm submitting to you, it is. If it's real, then we should be doing a lot better job telling people about these things and not hiding behind just the pleasantness of God wants to bless, God wants to bless, God. He does. But this is also has to be a part of our message. You follow? Let me pray and close this out. Father, I honestly, I don't even know how to close tonight out. If there is any... Uh, if there is anything tonight, Father, that I have misrepresented from your word, if there is anything that I have spoken, Father, that is contrary to your scriptures on this topic, I pray, Spirit of God, that you would enlighten people, give them insight, uh, give the elders of this church insight to point out where their error is. This is too important of a topic for people to just walk out tonight going, wow, that was a deep discussion. But what is real and what is true about the, just the truth of your holiness and the time of judgment that you have declared, I pray that you would bother us with it. I pray that you would let it start to penetrate us because we're living in a culture that only wants to talk about your love, does not want to deal with some of the realities of the end times. I pray that you would challenge us in Jesus' name. Everybody said. Amen.